Hello and welcome to Giving Ventures, a podcast to help you grow your giving and change the world for the better. Each episode, we share innovative charitable efforts leveraging private philanthropy to solve public problems. I'm your host, Peter Lipset, Vice President at Donors Trust. This show is a product of Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor advised fund focused on helping conservative and libertarian donors of all capacities simplify, protect, and grow their giving. My colleagues and I talk with a lot of groups doing great work. This show lets us share a bit of what we learn with you so you can discover new projects for your own philanthropy. The end of the Supreme Court session had big doings, and perhaps no verdict made such a splash as the 6-3 decision to overturn affirmative action. The cases themselves that led to the decision have been nearly a decade in the making, and the argument over race-based admission has gone on for decades. So what does this decision mean for the future of equality and opportunity in America, Giving Ventures is not a news and opinion podcast, and you can get your hot takes at any number of other outlets. What I wanted to look at were the groups that were most affected by the decision and who were helping to mark out a positive future for true diversity. Lots of people have been wondering what a post-affirmative action world looks like, and the groups you'll hear from today will help to paint that picture. First up, we'll hear from Students for Fair Admissions' Edward Bloom. This was the group that brought the cases against Harvard and University of North Carolina that led to the big decision. Then we'll hear from Center for Equal Opportunity and Color Us United, two groups deeply engaged in the research and advocacy that promotes equality of opportunity in a colorblind society. This is a tricky, fraught issue in a lot of ways, but one where I think conservatives and libertarians have firmer footing on the moral high ground than they're often given credit for. I think you'll hear that with our guests today, so let's jump in. No one has done more to put affirmative action into the news recently like our first guest, Edward Bloom, founder of Students for Fair Admissions. It is SFFA that brought these two cases that the Supreme Court so recently decided against Harvard and University of North Carolina. Edward founded the organization with the stated goal of restoring what he calls the original principles of our nation's civil rights movement. That is, that a student's race and ethnicity should not be factors that either harm nor help that student gain admission to a competitive university. So, Edward, great to talk to you. Uh, and I know you're doing a lot of interviews right now. You know, I saw on Barry Weiss's Substack an article where the author framed up Students for Fair Admissions as simply being, quote, committed to dismantling affirmative action. Uh, Is that too simplistic? How would you describe the organization's mission? Well, the mission of this organization has been, from the very beginning, to eliminate the use of race and ethnicity in college admissions. Uh, That's a a narrow mission. Um, uh, We did not intend to become an advocacy organization for certain types of admissions policies. Uh, we're kind of a one-trick pony, and that was, our, that was our goal back in 2014 when the organization was formed, and that apparently is what we've just accomplished at the Supreme Court. We'll come back to that about the future of the organization here in a minute, because it is, it's interesting. It's, it's rare that an organization hits those big, hairy, audacious goals, so we'll come back to that. You filed the original cases uh, against Harvard and UNC in November of 2014, Uh, And the original request for cert with the Supreme Court was several years ago in late 2021. You finally got to argue this fall before the Supreme Court, or maybe it was the winter. Two questions in one. Why take on this fight in the first place? And how have you kept going and stayed motivated for these nine years? Well, I think I'm with the vast majority of Americans who believe that a student's race or ethnicity shouldn't be a factor in whether they're accepted or whether they're rejected. You know, Peter, sometimes um, causes and movements find you. You don't really go looking for them. And uh, I don't uh, 30 plus years ago, I became aware of, of how race and ethnicity is used in shaping our election districts. And that was sort of the beginning of the, the interest I have in how race affects our lives as Americans in multiple areas. The courts move slowly. Uh, we had uh, the lower courts put this, these two cases on hold for about a year while Abby's case was back at the Supreme Court. And then we had to wait until um, the U.S. Solicitor General 
uh, submitted a brief uh, in support of Harvard and UNC. That took an additional six months or so. So you just kind of keep going. I'm a, I'm a former marathon runner, so I know what it's like to hit uh, mile 19 and mile 22, and uh, we surely hit those miles, but we, we, we made it over the finish line. And what are you doing organizationally, you know, from, from where you sit during those long stretches where nothing's happening? Is there any way to move the ball forward? Do you just prepare for the next step? Well, part of, part of um, you know, any legal strategy should include not only um, convincing uh, judges and justices, but also, also the court of public opinion. Um, spread your message uh, uh, widely. Talk about the unfairness of, of the thumb on the scale in, in college admissions. Write op-eds. We had to raise money for our lawyers. Um, uh, we had to find new students to join this organization every year. The students that joined in 2014 as members really no longer had standing as members. So we had to find students who had been rejected from these two schools every year, year after year after year. I had to travel all over the country meeting students and their parents and telling them how this would all work. You know, in meeting with those students, was there anything you really took away from the conversations with them? Well, well there were two things. Most of the most of the kids at Harvard were the children of of immigrants, and uh, those moms and dads were very concerned uh, about uh, the identities of their children becoming public. Um, you're rejected from Harvard. Kids end up at places like Emory or Tulane or other, you know private schools and hope one day to apply to Harvard Law School or Harvard Medical School. So getting moms and dads comfortable with, with having those students join this organization was a big part of it. But, but really more importantly, the, the effort, the time, the passion that these students put into their, their, their educational experiences, K through 12, and then to have this happen to them. Um, it's one thing for a, a a really bright young student to apply to 10 schools and only be admitted to a couple. But it's one thing for a kid with a 1590 SAT, valedictorian, um, um, you know, uh, an accomplished varsity athlete, all kinds of activities, to be rejected from all of them, yet see some of his, his schoolmates with far lower academic um, accomplishments be accepted to them. And the only difference was that, you know, some of these kids were Asian, some of these kids were white, and the kids that were accepted were African American and Hispanic. Uh, and, and, and white as well, by the way. Um, uh, Harvard, Harvard um, had a preference for not only African Americans and Hispanics, but also whites over, over Asian Americans. So that's, that's, a, that's a very disconcerting thing to, you know, to talk about. Now, you do still have another case pending. There were three major cases that you were working on, two now decided with the Supreme Court, but there's also Students for a Fair Admission versus University of Texas. What's the status of that one? Is it go on with these uh, this new precedent? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put on my amateur legal cap and tell you that uh, our lawsuit, our similar lawsuits against the University of Texas and Yale will likely be declared moot. Um, uh, Regardless of what Yale is doing, we know it's been using race. It admits that UT has been using race. That is now forbidden. So those cases um, should come to uh, some kind of finality probably over the next, uh, I don't know, three to five months. There's a lot of articles out there linking donors trust and the work that we do to the work you do. Obviously, like so many causes, you've received some money from donors trust uh, from the different clients that we work with. But your project was also initially incubated at Donors Trust in a way that many people may not know that Donors Trust does in terms of serving as a fiscal sponsor for new fledgling organizations before they spin out. That Donors Trust relation worked out pretty well for you? Yeah, I, I always was a little saddened to be thrown out of the thrown out of the Donors Trust cradle because it was you guys did such terrific work, um, took care of a lot of administrative things that uh, came back to me. But truly, as we grew, it was necessary us to stand on our own two feet and have our own administrative um, regimen. But um, 
incubating with you guys was wonderful. Well, we have been excited to see you fly far and fast. So at the top of the show, we kind of talked about the fact that I mean, you got these wins now. And so kind of now what? A lot of nonprofits say they're working to put themselves out of business. You kind of did uh, to a certain extent. So in the wake of these wins, what is next for Students for Fair Admissions? Have you effectively put yourself out of business? Uh, I, I wish that were the case. It's likely that Students for Fair Admissions and the issue of race and ethnicity in college admissions, we are at the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. It is, it is likely. Um, the world uh, reporting is full of this, that colleges and universities are going to use proxies for race. Some of those proxies may be legal. Uh, most of them won't be. So we were going to probably take off our litigation cap for now and put on a new watchdog cap. We're going to be um, examining what public universities are doing with their admissions policies because they are subject to freedom of information FOIA um, uh, disclosures. And we are going to dig deep into the private school world of admissions officers and make connections. And um, we're going to watch uh, over the shoulder of what colleges and universities do going forward. And you have some other projects in the works. Just tell us briefly about this one that I think will be interesting to the folks listening, uh, going after some of the boards of some of these and, and some of the mandates around boards. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm the president and founder of another organization called the Alliance for Fair Board Recruitment, uh, another membership organization. Uh, I formed this organization to challenge um, uh, the state of California's board diversity quotas. This was a piece of legislation that Governor Newsom signed a couple of years ago requiring those public corporations domiciled in the state of California to have certain percentages of women, racial minorities, uh, and those who self-identify as LGBTQ. So uh, as an example, in the state of California, if you're a five-member board, uh, of a public corporation, and you have five African-American women on that board, that's legal. If you are another corporation, but you have five white men, that is illegal, and you will be fined hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We sued the state of California as a membership organization, and just a few weeks ago, a district court in California ruled that that statute uh, was unconstitutional. Now, the state of California has said they're going to appeal it, so we're going to have to go to the Ninth Circuit. Fingers crossed, but, you know, we've got work in front of us. And uh, the other case uh, we challenged was NASDAQ's uh, board diversity disclosure and real quotas, all, all, close to quotas as well. So that's in the Fifth Circuit. We argued that, I mean, probably seven, eight months ago. We're still waiting for an opinion here, so... Those, those two cases are ongoing. Well, Edward, not everyone is willing to take up fights like this. And uh, I think it is very brave what you've done. And congratulations on the success of the Supreme Court. And best of luck as you fight on with Students for Fair Admissions and the other, other hats that you have on. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. By chance, I sat with our next guest, Devin Westhill, at a dinner last year. We went on to have one of the most lively, interesting, and challenging conversations I'd had in a while on issues of race and opportunity and a whole gamut of things. Devin is president and general counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity and is a truly principled voice for the idea of opportunity and true civil rights, and I am excited to talk to him. Devin, you state that the Center's mission is to study, develop, and disseminate ideas that promote colorblind, equal opportunity, and non-discrimination in America. So uh, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, thank you so much, Peter, for having me. Um, I'll say we've, we've done that a number of different ways over the course of nearly 30 years. The organization's been at this since the turn of the century uh, in 1995, um, uh, both in the court of public opinion and also in the court of law. Uh, but one of the ways in which the organization has distinguished itself from others is by publishing studies. Um, that document the use of race, 
um, and ethnicity in making decisions and admitting students to schools, um, both at the college and university level, but also at the graduate and professional school levels as well, uh, at more than 80 schools. Um, and that has really led to an opportunity to study um, and think about how race is used um, and how equal opportunity might be better uh, promoted in colleges and universities and in other areas of American life. Well, you penned a article, at least that I read, in the Philanthropy Roundtable's website the other day, arguing right before the Supreme Court verdicts came out on the Harvard and UNC cases, saying that if it was overturned, it wasn't the end of the world. And you close with this line that I'd love for you to elaborate on. You say, if the Supreme Court outlaws racial preferences and college admissions, the only thing that'll be different is that it will no longer be easy to pretend one is making positive change by holding back some people in order to artificially advance others. So elaborate on that. And I imagine that ties into the research that you were, you're doing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, at the end of the day, what we know in a closed system, in a zero-sum game, which is uh, what college admissions are, um, that if some people are going to get preferences for their race, other people must be held down because of their race. Um, and it may look good on graphs and, and flashy charts and so forth to say that you're really helping minorities. Um, you have many more of them coming onto your campus than you otherwise might because of uh, these preferences. You are really uh, harming others as a result of that. I mean, so what I think uh, is important that schools and others concerned about social and economic advancement of the disadvantage, but I think if we're being charitable is what proponents of affirmative action really want, uh, can do instead, is deal with the root issues of why certain applicants are academically uncompetitive. These issues include, and I write in my piece, subpar K-12 education, poverty, uh, and the failure to support family uh, and community cohesion. These measures uh, I wrote in that piece would all do more, in my view, to improve access to opportunity and upper mobility for the most vulnerable than race preferences and college admissions have done in half a century. Yeah, I think the the K-12 piece in particular, I hope, given that it's already having a moment, will get a bigger moment uh, to show that you know we can we can have successful people of all colors if we give them a good start, right, <laughs> with K-12 education. And I imagine your research bears that out. So the obvious question that comes for a lot of people who have just been swimming in this water of affirmative action for so long is, okay, well, what now? What replaces it? Which may or may not even be the right question. But, you know, if we are to do anything. What do you, what do you, what is the Center for Equal Opportunity see as the right way to create diversity on, on campuses and elsewhere? Well, look, at the end of the day, what schools should be focused on is educating their students the best way that they possibly can, seeking out truth, um, and admitting students based on their merit, right? This is test scores and grades, uh, but also what they bring to the table that is different or unique about them that promotes a more sort of true diversity type of view of each individual. Uh, unfortunately, what I think we're going to see, um, and lawyers like me and other advocacy organizations and folks who uh, put their funds towards ensuring equality of opportunity for everyone should be um, focused on, is that schools are likely to try to evade this ruling by the Supreme Court in Harvard and UNC um, to maintain their racial diversity through, quote unquote, race neutral means, right? This is the idea that uh, something that doesn't take race into account on its face, but is for the purpose of racial diversity is okay. The Supreme Court clearly said in this decision in Harvard and UNC, which uh, again, just, just came down, um, that what you cannot do directly, which they said is race discrimination for diversity, you can't do indirectly either. And we have to be vigilant in holding them to account for that. Yeah, Roberts's decision did seem to try to anticipate the chess pieces uh, a few few moves out. How do, So how does the center hold people accountable to that, to this decision? What is your role in in seeing that the words that Roberts laid out in that decision actually get carried out? Well, there are a number of different ways. One of the things that the organization, the Center for Equal Opportunity, has done, again, for nearly 30 years, is to just ask for information from school. Sometimes it's very difficult to get that information. Uh, these are oftentimes called FOIA requests, right, the open records requests. Um, and we've gotten a lot of that from a lot of schools, and that's how we've been able to 
uh, do the studies that we've done on admissions, again, over at over 80 schools in the course of our history. Uh, so that's one way, get information for them, but also give that information to our very litigious friends uh, who are interested in vindicating uh, the idea that uh, e you know, equal protection under the law is, uh, is something for everyone in this country. Um, and then I think it's important not to forget that, it, that whoever is in charge of the government, particularly the Department of Education and the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, uh, will have an outsized influence on, on schools and what they're doing. So uh, that's important to keep an eye on as well. And we support individuals who have an idea of um, equal opportunity and, and not equity of outcome running those organizations, and we will support them. You mentioned earlier, not just education uh, as a feeder to ultimately creating a more diverse society, but also family formation, which is an interesting point, one that doesn't get talked about, frankly, as much as I think it should. Uh, I know it's one Ian Rowe, I believe you know as well, has talked about on, on the show back in episode 21 about that and the victimhood narrative, uh, which is also an issue for you. Are you optimistic that this decision is going to force a conversation about that victimhood narrative or maybe on the family formation side? I am optimistic about it. I think we've already seen it begin to take form or, or begin to take, uh, take shape. The, the issue that we're dealing with when it comes to the victimhood narrative is I think a fundamental disagreement we have right now as it pertains to equal opportunity and equity of outcome. Some people think, uh, as prominent anti-racist scholar Ibram X. Kendi has written, uh, the only remedy for racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy, he goes on, to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That is a great way to devolve into a never-ending doom loop of bigotry and hate. I'm firmly on the side of Justice Thomas and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and most of the country as well in thinking that uh, blacks and Hispanics and people of every race and color can succeed in this country, uh, can take charge of their lives, uh, and believing that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that, and discrimination cannot drive out discrimination. Only equality can do that. Before we wrap up, you talked about a lot of what you're doing researching these schools, but you're not just spending all your time researching schools. You've got a lot of other things going on there at the center. I want to particularly talk a little bit about one interesting program of yours, your CEO Civil Rights Fellowship, CEO being the acronym of the organization, not chief executive officers. Um, but the Civil Rights Fellowship, talk to us about that and what it's doing. Yeah, thanks so much for asking about that. It's a major program that we started at CEO uh, to try to get at an issue that I identified when I ran the civil rights program at the United States Department of Agriculture in the Trump administration, which is we are very thinly uh, staffed with talent um, on the side of equality of opportunity. Um, there are 100 to 1 individuals who are graduating from colleges and universities who are interested in civil rights, who are interested in race relations, but are on the side of equity of outcome. Again, there's a fundamental disagreement between those two different things. Um, and I thought it was important to create a pipeline of law students, particularly, although I'd be very interested in, in potentially growing this out, but particularly law students who are interested in equal opportunity and would like to pursue a career in this space who otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, find the training to do so. We train them uh, every summer and send them out into the world to do good work in the area of, of civil rights and equal opportunity. How many are going through that at any one time? How many have gone through it total? Well, we've, we, our pilot program was last summer. We had a dozen students. We like to keep it somewhat smaller, although it, there, it's, it's possible to scale it. Uh, and this summer we'll have a, a comparable number of students. So one last question briefly before we go, because you're you're in this all day long and all these phrases and this complex conversation. Will you define for our listeners how you view equality versus equity? Yeah, e equality of opportunity is giving everyone the same shot at using their own talents and their own abilities to find their own success without arbitrary barriers in their way, whether that be government stifling you uh, or private enterprise stifling you in one way or other for some uh, purpose that is not rationally tied to uh, what you view success to be. Uh, equity of outcome is very different. It's about propping up some people 
to uh, rejigger the outcome uh, based on some immutable characteristic, oftentimes like race or or sex, uh, to get at um, a, a predetermined outcome of, of those characteristics. Um, that really requires authoritarian methods uh, that trample on our rights to uh, determine for ourselves what we're going to do, how we're going to get to our, our uh, idea of success. Um, and it really is the sort of thing that we should be uh, against. Um, it's not what this country was founded on. It's not what uh, this country was uh, refounded on uh, after the 14th Amendment. Um, and I think that we ought to be very, very careful uh, when thinking about those two concepts. I think that's a great, great articulation. That's really helpful for me. It's, you know, I don't know if the conservative side, the the right side has gotten a good pushback and, and simple language and how to articulate this to people who aren't in it all day. And so I appreciate that. And I appreciate all that you and the Center for Equal Opportunity are doing. It's, it's great. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you. The common story today is that America is hopelessly divided by race, built on racist ideas, and requires an acceptance of the victimhood narrative that we've mentioned earlier. Color Us United challenges the narrative that the United States is a racist, hateful country. Kenny Shu helped challenge race preferences in California during the Prop 16 debates a few years back and now spends his days as president and primary spokesperson of Color Us United. So, Kenny, uh, delighted to have you with us in this busy, busy days post the verdicts with Harvard and UNC. But let's, we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, Color Us United speaks pointedly towards a race-blind society. That's that's part of your tagline. But it's becoming more and more common to hear that this language of being colorblind is actually racist in and of itself because it negates a part of a person's identity. So how would you how do you react to that? How should we be thinking about this colorblind idea these days? That we shouldn't be making assumptions about a person based on the color of their skin. Um, that's what colorblind fundamentally means. Um, what the other side wants is they want you to look at somebody who is black and say, oh, poor pity you. Let's give you some unmerited preferences or to look at somebody who's white and say, man, you're privileged because you're white. I reject that. There are a lot of people who are white who are born into many oppressive and impoverished circumstances. And there are many people who are black who are born into very good circumstances. So the trick is to get to know somebody as an individual, not as a member of a race. So let's talk about how Color Us United does that. You were really built to to push back on that idea and push back on those who want to divide America, particularly along racial lines, and not just black and white, but Hispanic and uh, Asian and everything else. So how do you do it? How do you go about your work at Color Us United? Well, one of the concerns that Color Us United has with some of the DEI ideology going out, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is that it's exclusively focused on race and sex. Um, gender, as they would call it, uh, which have very little to do with a, who a person actually is. Far more important is a person's interests, accomplishments, abilities, backgrounds, those kinds of things. And what we do as Colorist United is we launch campaigns that target uh, companies that are propelling divisive DEI ideology based on these characteristics. So, for example, we just... Uh, went after the University of North Carolina's medical school. Um, as you know, medicine is like the one place where you want the most qualified doctor. You don't care what the color of their skin is, but they were promoting doctors based on, if you know, if you were black, you would get a better preference. Um, and they were also subjecting their own doctors to bias training that suggested that their own institution was racist. Why would you say that about your medical institution, you know? Um, you should have some pride about your medical institution and your ability to have non-discriminatory care. Instead, they were trying to make everything about race. So we stepped in, we launched a petition campaign, we lobbied the trustees, and we were able to get them to revoke their task force to integrate social justice, their DEI task force. So that's one of our successes, uh, stopping the encroachment of race-based ideology into medicine, which, as you know, um, race has nothing to do with the merit or a character of an individual. Yeah, this is your um, MEDS framework, if I'm not mistaken. So so what does that, does the MEDS stand for something? What does that framework look like and how does it kind of roll out? One of our strategies, because UNC really wanted us to come up with something that is an alternative to 
race-based DEI. So we came up with an alternative called MEDS, which stands for Merit, Equality of Opportunity, Diversity of Thought, and Straight Talk. Merit means that we should be promoting only on the basis of characteristics that, you know, are universally regarded as meritorious of a person. You know, we shouldn't have race involved in the picture at all. We also shouldn't have, you know, your legacy status involved at all. Equality of opportunity means that we should be trying to provide health care, non-discriminatory health care, but we shouldn't be expecting equal outcomes. For example, why do black women, you know, have higher diabetes rates than white women? Well, have you considered the rates of obesity? You can't ensure equal outcomes, but you can do your best uh, to provide care, you know, at the level of care that they need. And then diversity of thought means it's very simple. You know, the left cares about diversity a lot. I care about diversity, but I want diversity to be way more than skin deep. Uh, As you know, any good medicine program needs to have a diversity of viewpoints to be successful. And then straight talk really means that we should not try to be politically correct about our diagnoses of medical conditions. You know, um, for example, gender dysphoria. If, uh, if a person thinks that they are a boy, but they are a girl, you know, it doesn't matter. You have girl related biological health problems. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we have, we should be able to skirt that issue. We shouldn't, doctors shouldn't feel like they're constrained in their ability to diagnose and, um, deliver care according to a person's actual needs. You mentioned that UNC actually was asking, you know, Hey, what, what do we replace this with? <laughs> what, what is the alternative? Uh, is that unusual? I mean, was that an, an honest question or were they, was it a flippant thing? And you were like, actually, we do have a solution. How are you bringing that solution to the table? At trustee meetings and conversations and also in the media. So Color Us United, we're equipped to do a couple of things and we're reliant upon the support of our generous donors. But Color Us United, the reason why we're able to make the impacts that we're able to make, we're able to get you know, UNC Medicine to rescind their DEI task force is because we expose the negative components of DEI. We personally lobby trustees to, you know, and get reactions from them. We build allyship organizations with other people in the UNC system. And then, you know, we present, we're going to have a board meeting with the uh, UNC Board of Trustees on July 28th. That was hard to get, but because of the strength of our evidence, we're able to um, really offer something of value to the to the system. We're not trying to destroy or dismantle institutions. We're trying to make it better. We know that DEI is an example of a corrosive influence on an institution. So we really work within and without organizations to make a change that we want, and we've been effective. And how do you measure that effectiveness? You know, it's not not always easy, <laughs> and the debate certainly isn't going away. So how do you know if you're really moving the needle? I mean, when you have public renouncements of DEI frameworks, I think that that's moving the needle. You know, that's what UNC did. By the way, we ran another campaign back in late 2021, because we started in early 2021, uh, targeting the Salvation Army, who was asking their members to repent for racism. Now, if you're a racist, yeah, you should absolutely repent. But, you know, uh, most of these Salvation Army officers literally sacrifice their whole careers to have help black and brown children in inner cities. They're like the least racist people you could think of. So we brought 18,000 donors through a petition campaign that we advertised on social media to, you know, impugn the Salvation Army for that, uh, the Salvation Army donors specifically. And we did force them to rescind their task force to integrate social justice. Now, why is that impactful? Because it shows that because DEI likes to make its claims based on some sort of universality. Like, we are the authority because everyone is adopting it. But we've shown two clear institutions that are not adopting it, that are actually walking back on it because they're seeing its harms. So that's how we're able to change the narrative of DEI. That's great. Yeah, that, that Salvation Army campaign was really, really fascinating uh, and, and amazing work. And, and I remember it, had, it was quite the media storm at the time. So good work for you on that. Now, you're actually on the board of Students for Fair Admissions. You, you were not a plaintiff in the case. You weren't a party in the case, but you're on the board. Uh, obviously, a big win for be overcoming affirmative action this week at the Supreme Court. What do you think that verdict is going to do for, for your work going forward? I think it's only going to put wind in our sails. You know, one of the things that I've instructed Colorist United to do 
over the next year is we're going to fight the four horsemen of the DEI apocalypse. So what do I mean by that? So race preferences it is a horseman of the DEI. These are four aspects of DEI that we disagree with, right? Because the left is always going to come at you. They're going to say, what do you disagree with about DEI? Why are you even going after our university or our institution? We're going to say, here's why. Because you're doing race preferences and admissions, which is not merit-based. Uh, you are subjecting your, your uh, people to unconscious bias training, which is unfair because they're innocent people. You are requiring mandatory DEI statements, statements of compliance. So basically like, um, you know, I'm a loyal party member. Um, and then you are teaching that your institution is racist to your students and to your employees. Why would you do that? You're only demotivating them from the goodness of your work. If you think you're a great institution, why don't you act like it? So those are the four horsemen of DEI. Those are the four tenets that we really oppose. And this Students for Fair Admissions decision basically was able to really tackle that first tenet, which is race preferences and admissions. But we still have three more things in DEI that we have to go after. So this is why our organization's work has continued to be necessary because we really, if you really want to roll back this narrative that America is a racist country and you really want to ensure a colorblind, merit-based future for your children and your grandchildren, you have to go after these other tenants of DEI. It's a great summation there and an a optimistic note. Colorado United is still fairly new, but it is clearly a hard-charging organization behind the work that you, Kenny, are doing and, uh, and your donors and staff, etc. So thanks for talking to us today about it all. Thank you for having me. As I said at the outset, while these questions of race, diversity, and equality are challenging issues to talk about, it doesn't mean that we should shrink away from the discussion. Our three guests today don't paint a picture in this post-affirmative action world of a more racist society or a less inclusive one. Instead, they're highlighting the fact that diversity is more complicated than some folks would like you to believe. And fairness comes not through exclusion and mandates, but by open doors and creating a society capable of lifting all boats. Over at DonorsTrust.org slash podcast, you can get a link to the show notes that'll point you to each of these organizations. I encourage you to learn more about all of them and get involved if it's a topic that you're keen on. You might also look back and take a listen to episode 27 of Giving Ventures, where I talk with Take Charge Foundation, Center for Urban Renewal and Education, and Woodson Center, three groups all engaged with the black communities on free market ideas and doing great work. I might also encourage you to look at Philanthropy Roundtable's True Diversity Initiative, which sounds similar themes to those we heard today. And hey, reach out with your thoughts or questions to me at tellmemore at donorstrust.org. That's tellmemore, all one word, at donorstrust.org. We always love to hear from you. We read every email that comes in. Really appreciate you listening, perhaps even subscribing, uh, so that you get new episodes straight into your podcast feeder as soon as they come out. I look forward to talking to you again soon. And until then, thank you for being a giver. Thank you.